That is number 15. Hello. Hello. Thank you for being here. This cold, crazy day. I lost power last night. This time, not because they wanted to, but it just happened. Oh, do the airport. The local airport was down too. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't bad. I but I I was still prepared. I was proud of myself. I had candles and all that. <laughs> And my micro television was working very well. <laughs> All right, so what I want to do today is basically we just got to go through the respiratory system and do call it an early night. Or we'll pick off the quizzy back on Monday. Is that all right? Yes. Good. All right, so how was that quiz? Yeah. Not too bad? No, I did do good. Good. Yeah, I mm -hmm. <laughs> Question 15? Yeah. Okay, we'll get to that, huh? Yeah, I think it was those cells. Yeah, I didn't it was like the Respiratory system. There we go. Can you bend Good. I gotta learn to be ready, huh? <clears throat> it's new for me to do this. Okay. Good. Respiratory system consists of the lungs and deal with gases. It extracts Oxygen from the atmosphere, what main gas does it get rid of? CO2. CO2. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. That's CO2. Mm -hmm. Not carbon monoxide. A main function of the respiratory system is to keep the body's acidity within an narrow range. That means the body has to finely control the hydrogen ion concentration. Remember, acidity has to do with hydrogen ion. The more they have, the more concentrated they are, the higher the acidity is, the lower the pH is. That's an inverse relationship. And cells, the lower, reading? the lower the pH is. You know, that, and a, a pH of two is very acidic. So it's kind of an inverse relationship. As cells break down, uh, cells, as cells break down glucose and harness ATP, the energy, Carbon, split, carbon atoms split off and combine with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. CO2 then combines with water, forming another thing called carbonic acid, which can then split into bicarbon ions and hydrogen ions. Interestingly, bicarbon ions are act reversibly, so they can either pick up or release hydrogen ion depending on the concentration of the hydrogen ion. So I don't need you to understand all the details of the, of the, um, of carbonic acid and bicarbonate ions, but I need you to understand that this is a buffer system, that is chemicals, that can pick up hydrogen ions and therefore control acid. Bicarbonate ions is the, is the alka cells. It's, the, it's what's in alpha cells that picks up the acidity. That's why they give it for stomach acid problems. And so it's the same thing, really, but it's inside the body. And so let's go back to that. As, as concentra CO2 concentrations rise, hydrogen, hydrogen ions too as well. In the lungs, the body breathes out the CO2, effectively decreasing hydrogen ion concentration and therefore decreasing blood acidity. So that works together. Another thing I learned is if you want to lose weight, the best, you always lose weight by breathing out your weight. Carbons, you breathe out carbons, and, and the weight is, is hydrocarbons. Okay. The fatty acids are, yeah, that's why exercise is good, you're breathing more out. I know, I didn't know that it was like, you know, thank you, thank NPR, I tell you. Keeps my brain, at, keeps my brain active, all that NPR. Uh, which other organ helps balance the body's acidity why are the production of the bicarbonate? 
kidneys. That kidneys. So when we look at that, the, the acidity is very important. So first you have, uh, you can neutralize it because you got, you got the buffering system of the bicarbonate ions that just picks it up. It's like, it's like right whatever it's there chemically. Then you got the lungs that breathe out the hydrogen ions, the carbon dioxide, and therefore control the acidity that way. And then you got the kidneys who can make more bicarbonate ions to make the buffering system bigger. So that's your three controllers for the acidity in the, in the body. I know, I'll tell you, you, by now you know it's important. The acidity is important. And that's drinking water. Air contains oxygen which the body extracts within the alveoli of the lungs and then passes it on to the bloodstream which then delivers it to the cells. In order to get deep into the lungs where oxygen can be exchanged, air has to travel from the nose or the mouth through a series of passages. What is the area collectively called that ventilates the lung? It's the conducting zone. So you have a, an area in the lungs where you don't have a, an exchange of gases and that just conducts the air to where we then have the gas exchange. So when we look at that up here, we see in order to reach the body cells, we have the, the conducting zone that just ventilates the air. So that's everything to all about here, where we then get the alveoli come out. The alveoli are the respiratory zone because respiration is when the oxygen diffuses in from the air into the blood. Respiration. Okay. That's really right. It's actually technically, it's really, it's external respiration because you have the, the air going from the air to the blood, which comes from the outside in, and then when it goes from the blood to the tissue, that is actually called internal respiration. They call that internal respiration. So that's your pathway of the oxygen, from the air to the blood to the tissue. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. So there we go, conducting zone. That was the answer. The upper air passages, mainly the nose and the pharynx, not simply channel air towards the lungs, but they also warm, humidify, and purify the air we breathe in. How does the body keep these passages moist? Mucous membrane. So that's all the spitty stuff. You got a lot of mucous membrane in the respiratory system. You got a lot of mucous membranes in the GI system as well, the gastrointestinal system. Sinuses are air chambers within the skull that help air warm the air and give volume to one's voice. I know mine are really big. All the sinuses connect to the nasal cavity into which they drain. If they get infected, and mucus blocks their openings, the pressure inside of them builds up and we get pain. Anybody had sinusitis before? The pressure mm -hmm. here, a lot of pressure here. And uh, which, which, which sinuses are most vulnerable to right. that problem? The maxillary. The maxillary. Okay. Oh, here's the mucus membranes. The other, the other mechanisms to keep well, to keep the, the air passageways clean are cilia. They're whipping action. They're whipping, cilia are the ones that whip in one direction so they can whip the stuff out of there. All the gunk that we don't want. But there are the sinuses. That one, so we got all these different sinuses, the, uh, the frontal, the, ma the ethmoid, the maxillary on the back, and we got the, I mean, the, 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 the sphenoid are in the back, and then we got the maxillary, and they all drain down, but the maxillary drains off. And so gravity is gonna have a problem with that. So it's gonna be the one that clocks most likely is this one, the upper one. Didn't I have a question about the comb show? I thought I had a question about the comb show. We're on six, but did I have a question about the conch show? 
Did I have a, a discussion question about the control? Mm. Let me look that up real quick. <clears throat> that way we could do that. Uh, because we do want to do the concha somehow. Nasal concha, there it is. Nasal concha within the nasal cavities are bony flaps covered with highly vascularized tissue. They are shaped in that way that when we breathe through the nose, the air has to circulate and slow down. So if you breathe, that makes sense? It has to sort of like, you can't just go straight in, it's gonna turbinate. That's why it's a tur they call them turbinates. They also call the conscious turbinates. Uh, how do they help the body prepare the air for the lungs? So they're the conscious. They're warming, and what else? Warm and making it moist. It's very important. So this is, um, this is why it's important when you go to a cold climate, you've got to breathe, through, it's easier to breathe when you breathe through the nose, you don't get the burning going down. If you if you breathe through the uh, if you breathe through the mouth, very often you have the burning that goes down. Like don't go to Chicago. My battery's not working today. Oh well, we're not going to worry about that. So that was that question um, with the conscious. The number six is the posterior part of the nasal cavity becomes the pharynx, which leads all the way down to behind the bulge one can feel in front of the neck. Behind that bulge, more prominent men known as the Adam's apple, is, where we, uh, is the area where we make voice vocalization. What is the voice box called? Larynx. The larynx, good. So that brings us to this next larynx, and look at that. Is an interesting construct. We have, oh, you should have one of those. Get one of those on the table, if you don't mind. Whoa. Those are the lungs. And yes, they are a little bit fragile falling off, so hold them together like that. And this first top piece here, that's the larynx right here. That's the voice box. You see the Adam's apple here in the front. And you can look down, and it has a thing going down. And that goes into the lungs, that hole that goes down. And at the opening of that hole, at the opening of that hole, is where we have vocal cords, where we have two cords. And the cords can open and close. And depending on how they open and close is how, how the sound is that comes out of it. Is it high pitch? They're, they're very close to be close and very taut, or are they more relaxed and open? It's like in a guitar, the top string versus the bottom string. And so that's happening all here. I do have some other models, but I don't think we have them for uh, in here. That show all that, all these constructions. It's very interesting because you've got the front. The front going forward is the thyroid cartilage. That's the Adam's apple. And as you go back on the bottom, Below it, you have the second cartilage that in the front is very, is very is small, but in the back gets thick and big. And from that big cartilage, uh, you have two things that stick up on top, the arytenoids. They're like horns that stick up. And on those, we have the vocal cords attached that go to the front to the Adam's apple, behind the Adam's apple. And they rotate, and then you've got muscles that rotate them around, and that changes the opening, the glottis, the opening going up and down. And then when air goes through it, those vibrate, and that's the voice. That makes sound. It's very interesting. Then you also have a flap, the epiglottis. Let's see if we have a question on the epiglottis. Probably, huh? Look at that, we do. Within a voice box, two vocal cords bend from the front to the back, anterior to posterior, as air passes by them, when we exhale, they vibrate and create voice. Vowels, A, E, I, O, U, are created within a voice box. Which structures help form consonants? Oh, crap. Lips, tongue. Lips, tongue. Teeth. Teeth. Palate. It better not be the nose. 
the, well, you push the tongue around and you goes up there. You have everything that is a, that's in, in the mouth. Everything in the mouth, really. <coughs> the nose is inside, outside the mouth. That's just. But I have to put that in because some sound nasally. And the larynx is is down there for the A O U, the the, the, the vowels. Once low enough, the trachea then, okay, so then after the voice box, we got the trachea, and the trachea, let's take the stuff apart here, hold on, let's put that away, and then we take that off, and then we take the heart out, we don't bite it, and then below the voice box, these, we have these, this one pipe that goes down, that's the windpipe, that's the trachea, right? And below that, then it splits to two. Oh, so this is the trachea, okay. Yeah, the trachea the is the one, two. And then as it splits to two, we call it bronchi. We have a left and the right one. And then each of the bronchi feeds each lung. One on the right feeds the right lung, one on the left feeds the left lung. Uh, they split into ever finer branches, getting smaller and smaller, until they reach areas where we exchange the gas, where the gas exchange takes place. What do we call those air sacs? A viola. So let's look at that on the picture. So we got the, oh, the epiglottis. Look, there wasn't a question, there was no question on the epiglottis. The epiglottis, we have to talk about real quick. When you look at <coughs> the Adam's apple, here is easier. You see that from the front. The thyroid cartilage is the Adam's apple. You see that, and then above it, if you touch it here, and then above it, you find a bone, like right above this bone. If you touch it, if you squeeze it, it hurts a little bit. Don't squeeze it too hard. You don't want to break it. That's the hyoid bone. And behind the hyoid bone, we got a flap of cartilage, the epiglottis, that just sticks up. And as we swallow, the whole thing moves up, and the flap goes down and stays in place. And as we swallow food, we don't want food to go down the windpipe. So as, this is the epiglottis. As we swallow food, and, and in swallowing process, this, this whole, chunk, this whole uh, 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 construction moves up, and that stays in place. The flap goes down, and it covers the windpipe. And, then you don't, and if you choke, the food goes down the windpipe because you were talking at the same time of swallowing. And this messes up the situation because it's two tasks for one moment. And, and it gets stuck right in here, and then you get these people go like, oh my God, I don't know what to do, and they can't talk. And you go and underneath and the siphon, the below the it, siphon. don't, don't talk, go, the fist is on the siphon, then you take the other fist below it. So you're like by the belly button, and you scoop in and up. By the belly button? Uh-huh. Yeah, you, when you do the Heimlich, we have a picture of the Heimlich, I think, when it comes to the food next week. But, but you don't want to break the siphoid because that goes behind and pierces the, the liver, and that's not a good idea. So you want to make sure you have a fist on the siphoid and then put the next fist below, but that's basically the belly button. And then from there, you go behind them and you push in and up, like. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's a good thing to know about the siphoid. I never had to do it, but you know, it's definitely if you need to do it. And in the baby, you just the, the baby. You have the baby face down, and you go from the back upward like that. I had to do the baby one. But pizza, you know. All right, pizza and a lot of excitement. So that's the um, epiglottis. That's the swallowing, and then we get into the lower trachea. I mean, the, the trachea, which we talked about here. That's that thing going down. And one thing about the trachea is the. Uh, Oh, look, there was a question. Why would that be helpful? That was the epiglottis. So why would the epiglottis be helpful? So we don't choke. So food doesn't go down the windpipe. Um, and then we also have in the, in the, in the uh, trachea, we have the rings. We have cartilage rings that go around in the front, but they don't go around in the back. They open in the back. It's horseshoe shape. This is the ring and it stops, and then we have a, 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 a membrane in the back, and then we have another tube in the back. 
So why will the horseshoe shaped ring be helpful versus the, having the whole ring around? Yeah, that's it. How the heck will you swallow food if this is the esophagus, this is where food goes up and down and water, and you have the trachea, and if that would be close with the whole thing, where would you have room for swallowing food? It would be like rippling down. <laughs> that would be a weird. Sometimes we get that when we have a lot of, in the back is the vertebra, and we have a lot of arthritis stuff in the vertebra. Some people do have a little bit of a problem like that. The food down? No, the uh, trachea. The trachea is the trachea. This is carbon. Okay. This is like like Tupperware plastic leg. Okay. That you think cartilage, you think Tupperware kind of stuff a little bit. I mean, they're soft. No, the the, the, the tracheal rings are pretty tough. Um, um, and the esophagus, that is a muscular tube. Mm -hmm. That that brings the food down is a muscle tube. So that makes sense why the trachea is that way. And then from the trachea, we go into um, that bronchial tree from <clears throat> wherever it splits, it goes to two bronchi, and then the bronchi split further and further. You can see that here, how finely tuned they get. And then at some point, we get small enough that we call it from a terminal bronchiole, not bronchi, now bronchiole, there's a little bronchi, to, and it goes into a respiratory bronchiole. And from there, we have that respiration take place. Because from those, we have then the alveoli that are sort of grapes looking things that come off of that terminal or uh, the respiratory bronchiole. And that's where re the external respiration takes place. Um, and that's basically it for that. So let's look at the next question. Does that make sense? That's hierarchy? Good. Okay, this is, remember, when we talked about the heart, I had you visualize pushing a fist into an air-filled balloon to demonstrate the continuous serous membranes that on one side attach to the organ and on the other side to the body wall. Remember that? <coughs> that thing? So we have this membrane that goes around the organ. The heart was resembled by the fist goes around the fist and then it also goes continuously without breaking around the wall making the inside have a space and that space is filled with serous fluid and that fluid helps with a couple of things it gives well it helps with friction it gives the organ room to move within a, a, a finite space and you don't have two things rubbing against each other which would be a problem we can see that especially in the lungs. I mean, how that would be a problem. Um, in the heart, the membrane is called the pericardium. What is it called in the lungs? Pleural. Good. In the heart, the serous membrane mainly reduces friction. In the respiratory system, it also helps us, helps keeps the lungs suction to the chest wall so that when we expand the chest, which is, uh, the, lo the chest gets bigger, the lungs passively follow that and fill up with air. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so when you breathe, you're really using muscle that the membrane, the lungs are attached to, that go with it and expand it, that, that decreases the pressure in the lungs, so the air wants to flow in, and when you exhale, you push them, it's like, um, the air blower for the fire kind of thing? It's that kind of thing. If something breaks the membrane, like a rope or broken rib, for example, the affected lung collapses and can't fill up with air anymore, making breathing more difficult. What's that condition called? Third one. Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax. I know, it's a hard one to explain. Uh, what else was I going to say with that? The suction? Oh, yeah, if the fluid in those, in that pleura here, if there's no fluid in here, you got to have a problem. you got to have a lot of friction when you inhale and the lung tissue goes against the, the chest wall tissue. And that, that's called pleurisy and it's very, very painful. 
It's like sandpaper feeling. Pleurisy. How do you lose that feeling? Well, you know, you could drain out. Like you get an anaphylaxis, you get a poking from the side. Okay. It, it might take a while to, or you get in, or, or you get infl inflammation. On it. Actually, it's an inflammation. Sorry, pleurisy is an inflammation of the pleura. So that's where the friction comes comes from. But it's a fluid problem, you know, from what the cause of the friction. So what does it look like when um, they say that your lungs have have filled up with blood? Hema. I know it's hemo something because it's blood. Hemato, thorax. Can you see any spot I forgot. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I forgot. I know, I know what you mean. And but then I you're forgot. supposed to drain it, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. they drain it from the side. They Sometimes they have to do that. All the pipes, blood vessels, nerves, and bronchi enter and exit the lungs at the same place, medially by the mediastinum. What is that called? The root of the long stem. Like, there you go, the hilum. <laughs> so look at the medial side of the lungs, right here, right here. That's where all the vessels go in and out. That's why you have the ability to have that continuous membrane because you only have a breakage in one place. And that's where everything goes in and out. Plus, when you think of organs, you don't want things poking in and out from all different angles and there's bacteria that come in, you know, all kind of stuff from coming from that place. You want to keep things separate. Good, you know, good fences make good neighbors, kind of. That's the idea with organs. Good fences make good neighbors. That's right. So then we get into the lungs themselves and the right lung has how many lobes? And the left lung has how many lobes? Two. Two and three. Why would that be? The left, the heart's on the left side. It's need more room, generally. I mean, in the body on the left, the hope's on the right side, the proper right side, but it's on the left side where it sits. And so that's that. Pulmonary vessels connect the heart to the lungs bringing blood close to the alveoli for gas exchange. Which one, artery or vein, carries oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart? Vein. Vein, good, you got the definition down, I like it. So it's oxygenated blood, but it goes to the heart, and a vein brings blood to the heart, an artery away from the heart. This is the one place where you got the thing be blue, be red, and it's called a vein. That's why you wouldn't know that. And they're actually the ones here in the back. These, on both sides, there's two coming in on the back. I'm not using this heart for the heart. I'm using the hard heart. But you still got these back on the back where they come in. That's the, that's the pulmonary veins. As we inspire, the chest cav cavity expands outward and also downward. The often forgotten belly breathing. Which muscles is mainly responsible for increasing the cavities in cavity inferiorly? The diaphragm. The diaphragm. The good old diaphragm. That is very, very important. You want to learn, if you don't do it already, you want to belly breathe. Stick that stomach out. Be proud of that. None of that military thing we have to do. Well, it is. I mean, deep breathing gives us more oxygen that relaxes the body more. You know, it is related. We freak out about, I mean, I had a patient, I told her, she's like, that's stupid. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> you breathe more in, you get more oxygen, you have more energy, you're more relaxed. If you're stressed out, you restrict your breathing, you, uh, you run around like crazy. So next time you stop studying and you're tired of studying, you're laying on the bed, Put the book on the belly and have it go up an inch and down an inch, up an inch, down an inch, till you fall asleep. We describe different respiratory volumes depending on how deep one breathes. Let's go right back to that. Quiet breathing without much exertion is shown as tidal volume during which only about a half a liter, that's about a pint, of fresh air is exchanges the lungs. More rigorous breathing, if possibly possible, by both inspiring as well as expiring more. Oh, we can do that, more rigorous breathing by doing that. What is the maximum volume of a single breath called? 
vital capacity. So that's all the way from all the way, well, all the way out, all the way out, and then all the way in, and that's the time. That's the vital capacity. And that should be coming up somewhere here. Where is it? Come on. There's muscles. See all these muscles? This is a cool picture. Uh, when you look at inspiration, you got the maybe the diaphragm, the dome-shaped diaphragm that pulls down. You can only see how much volume that changes. And then you got the external intercostals. They bring the ribs up. That's the two places. And then the internal intercostals help expiration, but mostly expiration is passive. So it just call, you know, it, it lets it go. It inspires, inspires, and then it lets it go. And I think that's what that is important about that. Isn't that a pretty picture? I would like that. Okay, we did tell you last. So that's good. And then that's the graph where you have the normal breathing, tidal volume, that's volume in milliliters. And then you, 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 that you exhale deeply, and that's the expiratory reserve volume, and then you in, inspire deeply, or yeah, deeply, and that's the inspiratory reserve volume, and then that whole thing is the vital capacity. And then you got the residual volume, and that stuff is just what's stuck in a, in a conducting zone. That's not exchanging air. That's just sort of in the in the area of the from the nose mouth to the lungs where we don't where we don't have any gas exchange happening. That's why you got that 1,200 liter, that's why you got that two and a half liter down there. That makes sense? Yeah? Yeah. No? Good. The vital capacity, here we go. Give me the point, I want that point. Gas exchange between air and blood happens within the tiny air sacs, alveoli, where alveolar cells, type one pneumocytes cling to capillaries. Another cell type, aha, that was that one. Type two pneumocytes secrete, secrete surfactant to help keep the small spheres from collapsing due to tension created by hydrogen bond between the water molecules. Did you get that? You know when you're like, um, I don't know, when, when you got, you got wa water molecules are lining the alveoli and you got this tension of the hydrogen bonds. Like, you know, little, some little insects can walk on water. They don't fall into it. That's that hydrogen bond tension. So you can only imagine if a sphere is very small, it has this tension, it just collapses on itself. It's like when you start blowing up a balloon, right? It takes a little extra, and then once you've done it, then it gets a little easier. It's kind of like, like that. And the surfactant is like, it's like emulsifying like in, the, in oil and water stuff. It goes in between. It's not an emulsifier because it's water, but it goes in between the water molecule and it disperses that tension a little bit. And that way the alveoli can expand. And actually a baby was not viable for lo much longer before we figured out how to make synthetic surfactant. And now that we know how to make synthetic surfactant, we can give that to the baby the lungs can expand much earlier in their life than before. We had the premature. With the premies, yeah, with the premies. And so that's the importance of the surfactant. But then we have a third type, and the third type keeps the alveoli clean. And I just think that name is perfect for those. What are those called? Dust cells. The dust cells. So they're dusting all the time. Somebody had a good idea with those. I know. The dust cells, and they are all, no, I'm moving all left and right. I should have reviewed these a little bit more. Here we go. So we got the main cells. Cell type one, you got this type two is the surfactant, and then you got the dust cells that keep it clean like the vacuum cleaner. So they are basically macrophages. Macrophages are immune cells. We learn those in the in a blood smear. But a lot of macrophages live out in the in the system. And so in the in the lungs they call the dust cells. In the skin, we call them the longer horn cells. And then in the liver, we gotta call them the kupfer, kupfer cells. Kupfer, like copper, but in German. Respiratory gases, CO2 and O2 and CO2, mainly travel between alveoli and the blood vessels by diffusion. 
Remember, diffusion is a passive process where a solute moves down a concentration gradient. We just talked about the nerve impulse again. That's a passive thing. It's the same thing. It's a higher concentration to lower concentration. So you think in the diffusion, and that doesn't take energy. That's why it's so cool. And so anything that needs to be kind of efficient in the body, you almost want it to be a passive process. It's much faster. It goes much faster when you run down a hill than when you have to run up the hill. It's that same thing. It's an energy question. Do you expect the concentration of O2 to be higher in the alveoli on the entering capillary before, which means before the block gets oxygenated? Higher in the, wait, do you expect the concentration of O2 to be higher in the alveoli or the entering capillaries? Where do you think? Alveoli. So as blood travels through, do you all get that? As we get blood from here, the blue blood means it's deoxygenated. And we, get, we enter into the alveoli. So that blood has about 40 milliliters of mercury as a partial pressure. When they measure the pressure, how much con concentration that oxygen has, we express that in millimeters of mercury. That's sort of the concentration. And here it's 104 in the alveoli, so that's much more. And by the time the blood passes through by the alveoli, all of that has diffused in, and we also get a concentration of 104 millimeters of mercury at the exiting capillary. So that's how that works. But again, it's important to appreciate, I think, the passivity of that process, how it just sort of scoops it over. As it comes to a neural control of breathing, oh good, the brain basically needs to stimulate muscle contraction while we inspire. Once the lung tissue stretches enough, receptors send a signal to the brain telling it to stop uh, contracting contraction of the diaphragm and the inspiratory muscles. We also have chemoreceptors measuring O2 and CO2 block concentrations. These send the signals to the brain which can then fine tune the force and depth of the breathing. That's pretty cool. Do you understand that? So we're going to have chemoreceptors that help us in the brain figure out how much oxygen is in the, actually they do more CO2 they measure, how much CO2 is in the blood and through that they decide how deep to breathe. That's pretty hot shit. I think. I mean, you've got to appreciate it. I mean, we take it for granted as we, you know, nothing happens, but then when we get old, it's like everything falls apart. We have to appreciate it. I know. In which part of the brain do we find inspiratory neurons that activate muscle making us inhale? Medulla, Medulla oblongata, all the way at the bottom. The more fundamental, the more to the bottom. You think that way. When you, you don't know in the brain and you have to think about it, the more like life sustaining stuff, we all go to the brain stem. The more thinking, go to the cortex. The more, you know, the more consciousness goes on. The cortex is consciousness. The brainstem is, uh, is automated stuff. You can think salamander brain is a brainstem. So whatever a salamander needs to do, you got in the brainstem, more or less, you know. I think of that way. Well, the brain is complicated. It's good to kind of have some rules around it. And then you can always, if you have to break the rules, you break the rules, but that's all right. Uh, then this goes a little bit into uh, carbon monoxide, how carbon monoxide is hard because it attaches to the hemoglobin stronger than oxygen. And that's, that's, that's why it becomes toxic because then the tissue don't have enough oxygen and they starve from oxygen. That's to so don't breathe in the exhaust from your car. That is not a good idea. And then here we have, when we got the hypoxia, we can see that in the lips that get them out of the water at that point, uh, or the fingers, or the, you know, the extremities. And here's the control breathing. So a lot of that stuff happens in here. Um, I just put this up. This is more detail than I need you to know. But in bio 20B, you can catch up with it. You can get it as a starting point, or in bio 2, and then move from there. Good. I think that's good enough.